private sector for a new coal power station, 2,500 megawatt. The Department of Energy will also be issuing a request for information for independent power producer projects to provide up to 3,000 uh, 3, megawatts of gas-fired power stations. Now, the other issue that we needed to address, which the Cabinet decided on, was to see the extent to which there can be a reduction of electricity demand. Now, the Department has also issued a request for information on possible demand-side options. The Department will be making announcements shortly regarding the award of incentives or subsidies to successful demand-side management proposals. The War Room has also been engaging with business organizations on the mechanism to reduce and better manage demand. Last week, I had the opportunity to meet with Business Leadership South Africa, which represents a number of businesses in our country, and these are some of the issues that we, we discussed, and they also had an opportunity to raise a number of proposals, and they put quite a number of proposals on the table. And working together with ESCOM and other stakeholders, we are definitely taking decisive action now to reduce the need for load shedding and secure our energy supply into the future. This is work in progress, and as the challenges reared their heads, we were clear that this is not going to be a short-term issue, it will be long-term, but we continue to invite all South Africans to work with us, to have a level of understanding, because we are addressing the issues that concern all of us as a nation. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Deputy President. The Honorable Van Lingen. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Honorable Deputy President, here's your presentation on the five pillars. It is actually a little bit misleading because we're not going to achieve with this what we are supposed to achieve. Although the plan has five pillars, a lot of it is window dressing and is actually only concentrating on the performance of ESKIM. And we do know that a third of ESKIM's generation is offline. Two of the pillars oh, are based that, on um, gas. Honorable Van Lingen, there's a point of order. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair. I don't think it's parliamentary to say on the five pillars, a lot of them is window dressing to the deputy president of the country. Honorable Van Lingen, please proceed. I think the deputy president will deal with the window dressing or no window dressing, but your point is taken, ma'am. Honorable, Honorable Deputy Van Lingen. President, Chairperson, gas and energy efficiency is what is in focus. The problem is that gas regulation is not in place. And energy efficiency needs, needs huge interventions in, on local government level, which is very difficult to control. Um, the plan seems to be devoid of actual economic data. And for example, um, when, we have when you have chosen to do energy efficiency, um, there is why, a point of another point of order. Why okay. are we why are we not doing the third and fourth windows of energy um, um, private? Uh, um, private producer program, the independent private producer program. You did say it's coming, but it's not, it's not happening fast enough. I have a couple of more points, but I will ask my question. You have, in fact, asked a number of questions, will Honorable the, von Lingen. Will the honorable may I, please, may I remind members, you have two minutes to make your preamble and to put a supplementary question. You still have some time, but you did put a supplementary question. I don't know whether you want to go back to the preamble to make do with the rest of your minutes, but honorable members, please confine yourself to the rules. You've got two minutes to make one supplementary question. 
I would like to know what criteria was used to assess the um, selling of non-acids or non-core acid and where we are going with those. Thank you, ma'am. Honorable Deputy President. To answer that uh, more directly, I mean, the Treasury and the Department of Public Enterprises are dealing with and it is uh, entirely in, in, in their hands. They are in the process of uh, dealing with that and I will not preempt what they are doing uh, by giving uh, a, a, an answer right now or even giving you a suggestion of what they are doing. Once they have concluded all that, they will go public and everything will be done as transparently as, as possible. They are looking at very and I think we should give them the opportunity and the time to come forward with whatever proposals they are dealing with. We cannot sit here and try to manage ESCOM uh, from far away. We give them the opportunity. There are quite a number of uh, structures, including treasurers, that are deeply involved in that whole process and the Department of Public Enterprises. And let me just go back to the opening statement. Uh, I don't know why you would say that what the war room is doing is window dressing. The cabinet gave the war room five issues to address, and those issues are being addressed. And we've been giving from last week some answers, some insight of precisely what is being done. The, the various of the issues that you are, you are alluding to are being addressed. The immediate measures have had to do with things like maintenance. We all agreed that the maintenance had fallen back and ESCOM had not focused close enough attention on maintenance. That is now being addressed. The fleet of generators are now being looked at very, very closely. The original equipment manufacturers are involved. A number of other contractors are also involved. And the skilled managers and technicians in ESCOM are dealing with the issue of immediate measures that need to be taken. The issue of conversion from diesel to gas uh, is a matter that does not really need much regulation because that can be done now. Regulation, clearly the Department of Energy will be finalizing all that and all that is in train to ensure that we do convert from diesel to gas because we're spending a lot of money on diesel. Gas would be a lot cheaper on a unit basis. And we're also looking at cogeneration. Issue of cogeneration is not a smoke screen. It's not uh, uh, anything that you're talking about. It is precisely what is being done with independent power producers. And this is an effort through which ESCOM, the Department of Public Enterprises, is dealing with a number of parties, number of stakeholders to address the energy challenge that our country faces. The fact that the business community has come forward to say we would like to work with you to address the issues that confront ESCOM right now should be seen in a serious light. It's not a smoke screen. It's not, uh, it's, it's not anything that, uh, that one should dismiss in the way that you are dismissing it. Those business people are serious people and they are equally concerned, like all of us should be, about the challenges that we face, but they are coming forward with answers. They are not coming forward empty-handed and with just ideas uh, that you know, are pipe dreams. They are coming forward with real proposals and we are working with them to ad address those. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Deputy President. The Honorable Mkilin. Deputy President, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, how do you think the five-year plan will uh, succeed when there is the leadership squabbles and instability at ESCOM? And uh, I also want you to maybe provide us with any proper and uh, convincing explanation as to why the four executives at ESCOM were suspended and whether this, not, this is not political expediency on the side of the ruling party. And that those who are maybe 
are they prepared to toe the line or not the line on the you know party politics? And Honorable, uh, Honorable, so Honorable Mutilen, I spoke in very simple English. You've got two minutes to make a supplementary question. That is a follow-up question which must arise from the response which was given to the principal question put. It is not a new question. So I want to avail the opportunity to you because you still have time yes. to put a supplementary question to the deputy president arising from the response he gave to the response he gave to the question of the Honorable Van Lingen. Okay. I am sure you were listening to him. Yeah, but I thought this would also make sense. Anyway, just because... It might make sense. Yeah. I do not want to have this dialogue. Order, comrade. Order. I do not want to make the dialogue. I just want us to go back to the rules. Okay. I do not want members thinking of how it makes sense and how clever it sounds. I want you to make a follow-up question arising from the response. Please avail yourself. Yeah. Deputy President, I'm with his Changan. Not a good Saguri, him for Oxlogwana, Hasa, Salia to make a case. Should to combat the Gurahina, Ringa Congo Mang Hello, Metatunga Shock of Business Tech, the above second car or lair. So now that Tagur Oshana office young winner, you go to good Tangan Sanabama Pinduna, and the Lokum Param go to good Tangan Sanabon. Mifikele, Chikongomelo, she, Shaguri. Shash Temso Matash Nikakuya, Ama Fin, Asasangel Gumilini, him a gag to make a gaze. He was so chaps and a banana tabata sungla when she been ready to go in by him. Shana, Minakunguri, Mina, Lerimla Bana Rona, Navanga Pindola to go in Africa to Ungaki. Go. Yeah, you can see, Deputy President. The issue about the so-called squabbles that you're talking about, um, I, I would say these are not squabbles. As the Minister of Public Enterprises announced, she said that the four executives had been <clears throat> by the board, requested by the board, and the chairperson of the board communicated that to them, that they were requested to be on, on leave of absence for three months so that an inquiry, uh, an investigation can ensue. And she was particularly concerned about the of information that was coming through and issues that she regarded as being pertinent to, the, uh, to addressing the challenges that ESCOM is facing. Now, that inquiry uh, should be commencing soon and really it is about getting information into her hands so that she can better assess precisely how ESCOM is going to go about addressing all these issues. There is no political expediency about it, uh, including uh, the, the, the issue now <clears throat> of, uh, of, of governance. The issue of governance is clearly a concern to us as government at the ESCOM level, and we are certain that the Minister of Public Enterprises, working together with the board, will be addressing the issue of leadership. Uh, every institution, every entity needs good, strong leadership to be able to execute its tasks. And that issue is being addressed, and soon we will have uh, answers and solutions to the challenges of leadership that we also face. But having said that, the issues that I addressed in terms of how the war room is, is helping to address these matters continues. Issues of the immediate interventions that need to be taken, that continues. Last I also announced that I appointed a panel of advisors of highly skilled people, eminent people, who are in providing ad uh, advice and coming up with solutions on how best we can address some of these challenges. So when it comes to leadership, it's not like suddenly there's a huge vacuum. The appointed acting people and they are acting and they will execute their tasks within the parameters of the policy framework 
that ESCOM has to operate under, and with the guidance of government, no doubt, but more especially the Department of Public Enterprises. Coming to the other issue that you raised in relation to Kurilabama Binduna, Hitrisan and Janina Bon, Kota Kumibjela Kur, Isanganena Bon, Vigler Lerngahel, Logi Sanganena Bona, we were able to hear, as I said earlier, their proposals. And one of the issues that has come out of that is that we are being a summit, a summit which will be held between uh, all, uh, amongst all stakeholders in our country, labor, business, and government, and ESCOM, and, uh, and, and, and all the key players. And that summit will address, discuss, come up with a number of suggestions, issues that face us all collectively as South Africans with regard to electricity provision. So we, it's not like we are doing nothing. We are working day and night to address these problems. One of the things that I even said to some of the ESCOM managers, I said, even if you have to go and sleep at the door of the power station, I want you to do that because we want energy provision in our country to be resolved. And the fact that they've been deployed to the power stations should be demonstration of the seriousness with which we are taking this task. And I'd like to assure all South Africans that we are addressing this problem. It is quite a complex problem. And it is not yesterday's problem. It emanates from our past. And we need to address it collectively with cool heads, with strong will, knowing that we will overcome this problem. We've overcome much more difficult problems in the past, and this electricity challenge, we will also overcome. And what we don't need is moaning and whinging and all that. What we need is people who will come forward and say, we want you to strengthen your hand, we want you to be strong, and we want you to take action to resolve the problems that beset the country. That is what we expect of all of us. Thank you, Dr. President. The Honorable Kaula. You had your chance, Mr. Mitileni. It is Honorable Kaulas. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Honorable Deputy President, in October 2014, the Honorable Minister of Finance announced a bailout to ESCOM of 23 billion rand to be paid in three installments or three tranches to ESCOM. Now against this background is an estimated amount of uh, about 10 billion rand that is owed to ESCOM by uh, government at national level, uh, at provincial level, and also at local government level. What I would like to know is what is this warum doing in respect of government also contributing to the problems of uh, ESCOM financially by this uh, failure to honor the payments which, 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 which is due to ESCOM. Thank you very much. Thank you, President. This is one of the issues that uh, has led the minister to request this investigation that let us get better information on precisely that as well. So the war room is aware that there are a number of problems. At local government level, they owe ESCOM. Even users in various parts of the country, they owe ESCOM. And a number of government departments also owe ESCOM. And now the war room is going through precisely some of those issues to address them to ensure that ESCOM has a better debt collection process or mechanism. And that is being addressed, and we are hoping that ESCOM will be able to sharpen its own mechanism to collect monies that are owed to it. And th there are quite a number of reasons why these monies are owed and are outstanding, but we are addressing that because we would like all those who owe ESCOM money, be they municipalities, be they government departments, be they individuals or individual users, they must pay up. We must pay up what we owe to ESCOM so that ESCOM can have sufficient resources to address the electricity challenge. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. The Honorable Zoni.
person of council, Your Excellency, the Deputy President, we are really happy for the clarity that you have given with regard to the various interventions by the government of the Republic of South Africa in trying to ensure that the situation of ESCOM stabilizes. However, maybe it would be in the public, public interest to know if government has actually finalized the issue of tariffs. Thank you, Chairperson. The issue of tariffs belongs in the terrain of uh, NERSA. NERSA as the regulator, as the one, is the one entity that uh, determines tariffs and clearly working together with ESCOM, of course with the Department of Public Enterprises, the tariffs are then finalized. But NERSA is the main player in this. So I think we should wait for NERSA to give that final determination and uh, it is that entity that we appointed, uh, that we have as the regulator, so that independently they should take into account various factors that should finally lead to uh, the decision on the tariffs. So NERSA, I'm sure, will come clean on all this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deputy President. We proceed to our third question, posed by the Honorable Mutara. Madam Chairperson, the South African Development Partnership Agency was established as a government component in the year 2013 under the authority of the Minister of International Relations and Cooperation. Currently, plans are underway to operationalize this agency sometime this year. The 8th South Africa-Germany Binational Commission was held in Pretoria. 1st of November 2014. It was co-chaired by the Minister of International Relations and Cooperation, Ms. Maide Nguana Mashabane, and the German Foreign Federal Minister of Foreign Affairs, Dr. Frank Walter Steinmeier. The BNC is comprised of nine committees which are responsible for implementing BNC outcomes and identifying new areas for possible cooperation between our two countries. The Foreign and Security Policy Committee of the BNC includes in its agenda extensive consultations on continental and global issues. Cooperation between South Africa and Germany is ongoing and there will be continuous engagements between the two countries to follow up on the outcomes of the 8th BNC. The 9th BNC, which will be hosted by Germany in the year 2016, like other international partners, working with South Africa as we expand our development cooperation on the continent. Thank you, Madam Chair. The Honorable Mutaro. Thank you, Chairperson. Deputy President, in light of the number of strategic agreements and advancements that we have made through these agreements, in your opinion, is South Africa still in need of strategic development aid? And are we best placed to drive and deliver on development packages for the rest of Africa? Thank you. Yes, we, we, we still need a number of engagements. And, and relationships with a number of uh, international uh, players, uh, countries included. We, we, we do need these to advance our own interests. We should remember that we are characterized as a developing country. And as we develop, it is in our best interest to have international linkages. And, uh, we have done extremely well in as far as having close relations with a number of partners, also in the form of forming binational councils with them, where we cooperate at close and are able to reach a plethora of agreements that are able to take uh, our 
objectives and vision forward. So as with Germany and indeed a number of other countries, we do enter into these agreements. And as we enter into these agreements, what we seek to do is to advance our own national interests. And so these agreements enable us to do so. They are a very good platform that enables us to achieve our own objectives. And of course, on a partnership basis, as we also help to advance the interests of our partners. And when it comes to Africa, um, Africa is a very important uh, continent to us. We're part, of, we're part of Africa, we are Africans. And as uh, we advance our own interests, we would also like on an integration basis to ensure that African countries that we have dealings with both economically, socially, trade-wise, and security-wise, are also advanced. And we start off with SADC, our own region, and we cooperate very closely with a number of countries uh, in SADC, and indeed with the rest of Africa. So reaching agreements, entering into agreements, uh, should be seen as part of one of our most important tasks as we extend our cooperation, as we extend our friendship with a view of advancing our own interests as South Africans, as a nation. We want to place our interests and the interests of our people uh, ahead so that we can address issues of poverty, unemployment, and inequality. And utilizing relationships with other countries countries, be they of advanced economic development or developing countries, we are able to achieve that. That is the remit of President Jacob Zuma's government. Thank you very much. The Honorable Julius, the Honorable Mutileni, and the Honorable Dabaskakne. <coughs> uh, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, Honorable Deputy President, during the conclusion of the 8th Germany-South Africa Binational Commission in November 2014, it was an announced that Germany had committed substantial financial resources to promote these countries' excellent bilateral relations. The negotiations also affirmed Germany's intention to assist, assist South Africa in its transition to a green economy under one of three focal areas of German development co cooperation, energy and climate. Uh, will the Honorable Deputy President please provide the details of South Africa's transition to a green economy with the assistance of Germany? Or are we only looking at Russia now? Thank you, Euclid. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Chairperson. We, as I indicated, uh, have various agreements with a number of countries, and Germany clearly is one of those countries that we have agreements with. And as a developed economy country, they have developed quite a number of uh, technologies that we can learn from, technologies that can help us to address our own challenges. And that is the advantage of having these binational commissions or councils, and through them we are able to mine some of their own technologies to get as much assistance as we possibly can. And in, with regard to advancing to a green economy, we are one of those countries that are greatly admired in the world in the way that we have embraced uh, the green energy uh, formation or generation. Uh, many countries have not, particularly in the developing uh, countries world have not advanced as much as we have. We have done a lot and we've utilized various technologi technologies from a number of countries, Germany included, with regard to solar, with regard to wind, and uh, uh, also with regard to, to various other technologies, gas as well. We are utilizing those technologies that we are learning from them. I do not have the actual detail right now of the extent to which uh, we've, been, uh, we've been working with Germany in a particularized way. But what we are doing is to take forward the relationship that we have with Germany, 
to address quite a number of projects that, that we have in common. And that is the advantage of the binational uh, councils that we have with Germany. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Mutileni, Honorable. Thanks. Um, the proposed South African Development Partnership Agency uh, would replace the African Renaissance Fund, uh, originally targeted to position South Africa as a leader in the regeneration of the African continent. Unfortunately, David President, South Africa sees the African continent as a war zone and not as a continent full of potential and worthy of a clear and strong commit, uh, commitment from the country. Is South Africa still committed to the African Renaissance project? If so, why is uh, the country no longer talking about NEPAD and the African peer review mechanisms, which were initiated in the, in the then uh, 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 administration? And how would SABDA reinvigorate the role South Africa plays in the development of the continent? Thank you. I missed the last part, sub the, what is that? The, the last part of the, the input, Deputy President, is the one that deals, that is the real supplementary. Yeah. How? How is SAPTA? How would the uh, SAPTA reinvigorate the role South Africa plays in the development of the continent as a whole? The first part, um, was a smuggling of a question on NEPAT and the uh, African Renaissance. And the Deputy President may choose to respond to it, but it is really a new question. <laughs> I, will, I will respond to uh, the one which is prefaced by South Africa sees Africa as a war zone. I think that is factually and completely wrong. South Africa does not see Africa as a war zone. If, if there ever was something that is completely off the mark and wrong, this is the statement that honorable member has just made. Uh, South Africa is committed to the African continent. We not only committed, but we are Africa. We are part of the African continent. And our commitment to its development is irrevocable. It's not to be brought ever into question. And if one wanted to know whether NEPAD is being implemented, uh, you need to see what South Africa is doing across the African continent. We have embassies drawn right throughout a number of countries in Africa. Uh, and we, we, we occupy pride of place, not only on the African continent, at the AU, we are a respected member of the AU, and we participate with, with all countries. And the fact that the African continent saw fit to elect one of our own, one of our own homegrown person, uh, uh, Chairperson Nkosazana Zuma Lamini, as uh, Lamini Zuma, as a, as a chairperson of the commission, should testify to the fact that our commitment to NEPAD is quite deep and it is thorough. Now, what are we doing on the African continent? We obviously are pursuing our own interests, but at the same time, we promote the interests of uh, the African, of various African countries in the way we trade with them, in the way we deal with them, both at a social level, at a uh, political level. And that is what we do. Uh, and we are advancing our interests as we advance the interests of uh, a number of other countries in, in, in South Africa. And DERCO uh, is the one that is dealing with uh, SADPA, and they are advancing our interests in relation to that. And I would, I would get Derko to give chapter and verse precisely of all the initiatives that uh, they, they are in, involved in. And SAPTA would 
as will assume responsibility for coordinating a number of other initiatives of, uh, of assistance, of cooperation with a number of countries on the African continent. I'd like to assure the honorable member that uh, we are living out the African Renaissance. We are implementing NEPAD. Our relations with various countries in Africa are underpinned by our strong resolve to make sure that we develop the African continent as we develop ourselves. And we do not want to see ourselves developing without moving along and cooperating fully with countries on the African continent. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you. Uh, the Honorable Lebaskarten. Thank you, the Honorable Chair. Good afternoon, Honorable Deputy. Honorable Lebaskarten, you are not speaking into the mic. Sorry, Chair, this is, I'm trying to let you see me raising my hand. I'm already in the corridor. Um, Deputy President, um, I would, know, what, would like to know what is or would be the difference, the form, the status, and the mandate of the South African Development Partnership Agency. And between that and the existing development partnerships that you spoke about now, such as the South African Development Community and the new partnership for Africa's development. So the differences in form, status, and mandate. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Honorable Deputy President. Um, the Department of International Relations and Cooperations has made a presentation, and uh, I think they have made it uh, to some of our stakeholders, on the establishment of the South African Development Partnership Agency. This, the key aspects of the South African Development Agency would be to replace the Africa Renaissance Fund, uh, where those aspects are to advance the African agenda promote regional cooperation, promote south-to-south -south cooperation, and promote the Millennium Development Goals with the objective of focusing on cooperation between South Africa and other African countries. That is the main objective. And uh, SARPA will address the shortcoming in the management and implementation of development projects, experience where the African Renaissance Fund uh, may have fallen short. And SAPTA will also use development cooperation as a tool to advance South Africa's foreign policy goals. That is what it will be doing. We'll be focusing on that. And this is no different from what I've been saying, that our main objective is to promote good relations with all countries on the African continent and get to a point where as we develop, we also, also foster the development of other countries so that we are seen as a good neighbor, an ideal neighbor and a neighbor that all countries on the African continent can do business with. So this is what drives and propels our foreign relations policy. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you, Deputy President. We proceed to our fourth question. It is put by the Honorable Kaula. Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Members, South Africa has signed bilateral agreements with Russia in several areas, including in the area of nuclear energy, in his 2015 State of the Nation Address, President Jacob Zuma indicated that any matters related to the procurement of nuclear energy will be done in an open and transparent manner. As announced by the Department of Energy, South Africa has also signed bilateral agreements on nuclear energy with China, South Korea, and France. Now, the process of signing agreements with the U.S., Canada, and Japan is at an advanced stage. The governance of the Nuclear Energy Corporation is guided by, among others, the Nuclear Energy Act, 
the Companies Act and the Public Finance Management Act, and I would, it would therefore be unaffected by any bilateral agreements. I thank you. The Honourable Kaula. Uh, and thank you, Honourable Deputy President. By the way, Honourable Deputy President, I noted with interest uh, the Honourable Deputy President's response uh, to the ESCOM question on the board of ESCOM suspensions, stamp of approval. And on a similar matter, next, uh, board uh, suspensions, blockages two different boards, similar issues, different approaches. In view of the developments at NEXA, where there are seemingly sour working relationships between NEXA board members and the CEO, and also sour relationships between NEXA board members and the minister. After the board suspended the CEO and the minister intervened for the board to reverse its decision, it is alleged that this was done to protect some powerfully connected people at NEXA. Should the board not be given space to implement its mandate transparently and impartially by, amongst other things, being left alone to conduct their original investigation on the CEO, an investigation which the minister had supported earlier on in December and even wrote a supportive letter on the move to the board, but later in February, she against it in a surprising about 10. Why is the board not being trusted to execute their mandate? Is this interference not shielding those who may be culprits in the required investigations? Thank you, Chairperson. The Honorable Deputy President. I am not aware of anyone who's being shielded. Um, the, 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 the minister, as a public official in our country, will always seek to act in a way that will advance the interests of the ministry that she oversees, the interests of South Africa, and indeed our interests collectively as South Africans. So what is underway is a process where things are being addressed with a view of finding solutions. And Clearly, solutions will be found, and this I would regard as a hiccup uh, in the process of the governance, in the process of trying to see how best these institutions should be run. And I would advise that let us wait for the process to unfold, and thereafter, and the government will be able to set out very clearly uh, what is the way forward. And I would say, let us have that patience. I know when these things happen, it is always disturbing, unsettling, unnerving for all of us. But let us be, rest assured that the matters are being handled and they are being addressed. And proper solutions will be found. As we always seek to find solutions for all the challenges that we face. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, sir. Honorable Fandingen. I'm standing here with my, um, the agreement between the government of the Russian Federation and the government of the Republic of South Africa on the strategic partnership and cooperation in the fields of nuclear power and, and industry in my hand. Why is it that government has been so secretive about this agreement? and wh whilst it has been made public by Russia already, and, wh and when will it be tabled in Parliament? Not only this one, but also the other agreements that you have signed as government, as um, executive. Honorable Fandingen, you're making my life very difficult. You are bringing in a new question. It is a new question. That question does not come out of what is asked by the Honorable Kaula. And I am again going to leave it to the discretion of the Deputy President, but it is a completely new question which has nothing to do with the question as put by the Honorable Kaula and the response that the Deputy President has given on that question. The Deputy President, 
Honorable Chairperson, I think it should suffice to say that when the President addressed the State of the Nation or put the State of the Nation to the Nation, he did say that all these things that are being done with regard to nuclear energy are going to be done in an open and transparent manner. That is what our president said. And I think we should rely on that and know that he has put all that to the nation. Thank you very much. The Honorable Mtileni. Uh, I'm, I'm covered because uh, part of what has just answered Mrs. Van Lingen was uh, what I was to ask. Yes. That uh, is this. Uh, All this the members. There's a member on the floor. Yes, sir. Proceed. I was, I was to say the deputy president has, has answered the question that I was to pose to him. Thank you. Because I was to say, is this nuclear deal not going to open up, you know? You know, or maybe leave the other ANC members, you know, with the kickbacks, you know, when this deal is... You are completely out of order, sir. <laughs> Deputy President, that was no question. Honorable members, that was the last supplementary request for supplementary that I requested. Question. Between Honorable um, Labaskagni and yourself, the Honorable Deputy President, and she's been trying to catch your eye, and it's not with disrespect that I'm getting up to point Honorable Labaskagni, did you want to make an, a supplementary on this particular question? Please take the floor. Thank you very much. Honorable Deputy President, apart from the fact that the terms of agreement leans very heavily in Russia's favor, with Russia, for example, being able to veto South Africans' intentions to do business with other nuclear vendors for a minimum binding period of 20 years, it appears that the agreement lays the groundwork for government-to-government -government contracting, which is designed to possibly sidestep the constitutional requirements for open and competitive tendering processes. What procurement process will be utilized to ensure that the nuclear build program will be open and transparent as the Constitution demands? Thank you. Deputy President. Madam Chairperson. One of the processes that is involved in all this is, as I said in my initial answer, a process through which various agreements are being entered into with a number of parties. And I did say that Canada, the United States, are also in line to be entering similar agreements with South Africa. And thereafter, you could say that this is like the preliminary stage. And thereafter, what has been happening now are pre-tender workshops that have been ongoing, involving a number of parties, officials, experts, various people from all those countries and entities. And they have, over quite a number of days, been involved in workshops and looking very closely at what is involved in all this. The next process is going to be the tendering process. Clearly the tendering process that we will in get involved in is going to be a tendering process that is very much in line with a good tendering process where, as the president said, there will be openness and transparency. That is what is going to unfold with all this. Now, all these ghosts and horror stories and things that people are talking about are, are things that they are imagining clearly, and I think we should rely on what this process that's underway will yield and precisely on what the president said in SONA. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. We proceed to the fifth question, which was put by the Honorable Makwe. He is not in the House. Arrangements have been made with the Honorable Nyambi. The Honorable Deputy President. I've been informed by the Department of Energy that it is currently doing an analysis and evaluation of all bilateral agreements on energy which have been signed 
with 63 countries. From 1994 until 2009, the energy portfolio was part of the Department of Minerals and Energy and most bilateral agreements involve both minerals and energy. The department itself has been requested to disaggregate this information so that the work done by the, en by the energy portfolio can be properly evaluated. The Department of Energy will make this information public as soon as this work has been completed. Government is currently considering further bilateral cooperation and partnership agreements, especially countries within the African continent. The bilateral cooperation and partnership South Africa is seeking and is planning to sign are focusing on policy and expert assistance. In some cases, pilot projects form part of this cooperation in sustainable energy infrastructure, such as a pilot solar rooftop. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Thank you, Deputy President. The Honorable Nyambi. Through you, Chairperson, Deputy President, is it possible maybe to give the House that has been given to that process of the evaluation of the bilaterals? Thank you, sir. Deputy President. I sought to get the time frame. I was not able to, to get it before coming here. But all I was informed is that the work is in process. And uh, once the work has been properly concluded, it will be made public. I'm sorry I can't give chapter and verse hour of when that will happen. Thank you. Thank you, honorable members. Any other follow-up question on this question? None. Oh, the Honorable uh, Honorable Deputy uh, President, has the government signed any bilateral cooperation with African countries? And if so, how many African countries have signed bilateral uh, agreements on energy? Thank you. Thank you. Deputy President. Honorable Chairperson, as I indicated, this evaluation is currently underway, and uh, so far up to 63 agreements have been signed. We'll be able to disaggregate all this and identify the number of questions that have been signed in relation to energy and with which countries. But what we can say is that in pursuance of our African policy of uh, being of cooperating with a number of countries in Africa, we have entered into a number of agreements, and uh, some of them have to do with energy, and that will be disclosed publicly once the information has been properly aggregated. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable Deputy President. That was the only other supplementary hand we had. We proceed to our last question of the day. It is posed by the Honorable Lavaskarni. Chairperson, thank you. In many countries in the world, public employment programs are important policy instruments that government use to create short-term employment programs. And this has been used as a policy instrument from time immemorial. Members, honorable members may recall from history that whenever there have been economic challenges that countries have faced, many countries and governments have embarked on public employment programs. So we are not new in this. Currently, we've got many of our people unemployed, and the government, as a responsible government, has decided that it will embark on public employment programs so that a number of our people whose livelihoods are threatened by poverty, structural unemployment, and economic recession 
including natural disasters, job losses and seasonal job demand shortfalls, their livelihoods are secured and advanced. In South Africa, the expanded public works program, what we call, as we all know, EPWP, is a government initiative aimed at addressing the triple challenge of unemployment, inequality and poverty through provision of short-term and medium to medium-term work opportunities. To ensure that the program is sustainable, the EPWP programs are designed to equip participants who participate in these programs with training and work experience to enhance their ability to earn a living in the future. Public employment programs under the EPWP cover a wide range of different sectors, including infrastructure, social, environment, and non-governmental. Since the establishment of EPWP, over 5 million South Africans have benefited from work opportunities that have been created through some of these programs. EPWP achieves far more than providing income to the most needy amongst our people. It also improves the lives of, poor, of the poor by providing a wide range of services as well as assets. For example, it provides home-based care for the sick and elderly by removing invasive alien plants. It creates better pastures for grazing in a number of parts of our country. And through better roads, it creates better access to markets, to schools, to clinics, and enables people to go about. Approximately half of all EPWP participants were unemployed for more than three years prior to working in EWP projects. The EPWP program provides an opportunity for them to work, to earn an income. And what many of us have seen is that as people participate in these programs, they are able to gain skills, which they are then able to gainfully use or deploy whenever they get more permanent work. These programs have been lauded internationally. South Africa has received great recognition for pioneering or charting new paths with regard to the way that we are implementing these public employment programs and they are serving a good purpose amongst our people. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Deputy President. The Honorable Lebeskahn. Deputy. Uh, Deputy President. <laughs> uh, would you please um, provide us with uh, the information on what measures will uh, the government put in place or did the government put in place to enable people involved in the short-term job creation programs such as the EPW to migrate into permanent and full-time positions as promised by the president by president Zuma in his most recent state of the nation address deputy president chairperson the EPWP programs enable people to gain skills, to also gain experience, and to be exposed to a labor market, to be able to learn how the world of work operates and works. And by so doing, they are in the main, particularly for young people, training ground to prepare young people for the world of work. It is through these processes that young people are then made attractive to potential employers. Because in the main, potential employers want people who have the measure of experience, who have a measure of skill, and who can demonstrate that they know how the world of work operates. 
So these EPWP programs, more than just being processes or a project through which people earn a short-term income, they are preparatory ground for people to showcase themselves to potential employers and demonstrate that they can work. Now, a number of them, some of whom one has met personally, have been able to say, through the EPWP uh, project, I was able to gain this job, job because I got used to the world of work and I was able to either do some building, fighting fire and all that. Now, a good demonstration of that is what we saw here in Cape Town, when we had fire in Cape Town. Many of those people who fought the fire gallantly are people who were trained in working for fire. They gained their skills there. And many of us are often tempted to dismiss these programs as Mickey Mouse, as amounting to nothing. In fact, these are meaningful jobs. They are job opportunities, yet they perform meaningful work. I have seen how those who work in the environmental sector are able to gain skills, removing invasive plants in our country, and have been able to free the waterways of our riverbanks, and through that, they also gain skills to know plants, to know what is invasive, and to be able to make a contribution in as far as the environment is concerned. After they get jobs, they finally, some of them get jobs in forestry, they finally get jobs in farming uh, operations and all that. So I urge us as South Africans, never miss as Mickey Mouse the task that is being done by all those people who were the, 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 the orange overalls in our country, they are doing meaningful work. Let us the respect and the recognition that they deserve. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy President. The Honorable Kaula. Thanks, Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Deputy President. The Auditor General in the 2013-14 audit report for public works states that uh, the EPWP employment figures are, in, in his audit opinion, unverifiable. Uh, I don't know if something will be done uh, to address that, but I also want to know Outcome four of the National Development Plan speaks of decent employment through inclusive growth. The Honorable Deputy President has partly responded to this, but it's indirectly. I would like to know the direct one, if the short-term job creation programs that we are talking about are a response to outcome four of the NDP in a direct but not indirect way. Thanks. Deputy President. Chairperson, clearly <clears throat> the issue of the being able to verify the job figures uh, should be a challenge because these, jo these jobs are created throughout the length and breadth of our country. Uh, quite a number of them at provincial level, but many of them at local council level. And because they are temporary in nature, and even as even if I were to be an auditor, I would also find it quite difficult to, to put one's finger on them at the time. But with time, after possibly a few months and so, the figures are set and they are verifiable. And I don't know what period the Auditor General was dealing with. The Department of Evaluation and Performance Management has been able to go into some greater detail in as far as evaluating the efficacy and the effectiveness of the EPWT, uh, WP projects. And they have been able to satisfy themselves that the figures that they have been given, they can look at them closely and they can verify them. 
So I think it's a pos possibly a question of timing in terms of when those figures can be verified. But it is a complex matter. I'm not saying that it is beyond the, the, the ability of the OT general to, to be able to do so, but I just think that we can verify it in a number of ways. Outcome four indeed talks about, of the NDP, talks about uh, decent jobs. Now, decent jobs are jobs where people perform permanent work, where people benefit from all the other uh, benefits that an employment process can offer them, like pension and uh, medical aid and all that. Now, EPWP jobs are not permanent jobs. Uh, we call them, or we should regard them as a stepping stone, as a good stepping stone, and that is why we call them job opportunities. They are not permanent jobs, and that is the clear distinction. And in this regard, we're not trying to hoodwink anyone. These are jobs that are of a temporary nature, short term or medium term, where people participate in a particular project, limited in time du duration, and, uh, and even the participant accept them as such. They know that EPWP jobs are for that duration and they participate enthusiastically knowing that they can either learn skills, they get experience, and they are then able to showcase themselves to future employers uh, who may want to employ them. So there's a clear distinction between the two. Thank you, Chairperson. The Honorable Essak. Honorable Chairperson, thank you for the opportunity. Deputy, uh, Deputy President, I'll try and keep it simple. Uh, will the Honorable Deputy President please provide examples, successful short-term creation, uh, job creation pro uh, programs, successful short-term job creation programs where government, the private sector, and civil society have worked together to combat poverty sustainably. Thank you. The Honorable Deputy President. You said you were going to be simple, Honorable <laughs> Member. <laughs> there are a plethora of them. I'm quite happy, Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Member, to uh, provide that information in writing because there are quite a number of instances. What I did cite was working for fire. This is where the private sector and government have been able to participate in training people, making sure that they can attack fire, work with fire without getting killed, without bedding out. Now, I know a number of instances where around the number of areas in our country on working for fire that has been done. I know of instances where these people have been trained through the EPWP program and they are then able to work with private sector entities and they become like an army on standby to fight fire. And they are then sustained through either stipends from EPWP, private sector also assists. And these are highly trained people who, whenever there is a fire, are then able to get into their vehicles, in their uniform, with their equipment, go out and fight fire. Now, I also know of those who work in the, environment, in the environmental sector, and I'm happy, quite happy to provide chapter and verse, a name and uh, operation as much as possible because these are real live instances. These are not imagined. They are real instances of people who are benefiting from this process and where there's a wonderful working together between the private sector and the public sector. Thank you, Chairperson. The Honorable Kosi Sika Morago, Obejani. Thank you, uh, Chairperson of the Council, uh, Deputy President. 
one has got no doubt that the program we are talking about, it's helping our communities a lot. There's no doubt, nobody will make you, you know, should make you to doubt that program. There are, you know, uh, little challenges that I would want to check, how do we monitor them? That of the five million that we are talking about, how do we be sure that we don't recycle one person again and, and again while others are looking at that particular person? What kind of monitoring are we putting in place to make sure that indeed this program achieve what we intended to achieve out of it? Thank you very much, Chair. Deputy President. Chairperson, thank you. I'd like to thank the honorable member for raising that question because it has been before that these programs should not be programs through which we recycle the same people uh, over and over again and they become like experts at working in EPWP programs. Uh, this is a process that we're still learning a lot of lessons from ourselves. And as we gain experience and knowledge, I'm sure we are getting better and better also at being able to manage the people who participate, and as we manage them, we should create a very good balance of uh, making sure that we don't recycle too many people. It is, I think, that you will find that those who have participated before do come back uh, to participate. The good thing is that they themselves know that this is part-time, and they come and they leave, and it's not permanent type of employment and so when they are not selected next time they will not believe that they have a right to have been selected and say this is my right role i should be here all the time so as we gain more experience and as we get better and better we will make sure that uh, the recycling uh, is not a great component program there will be some who will be participating maybe twice or thrice, but we need to have a level of consideration to ensure that we do not recycle too many people. They're looking for experience, but we should be more focusing more, yes, on younger people and on bringing new people into the program so that every South African who is without a job and who can participate in the program has a chance to participate. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Deputy President, this concludes our question session for today. We wish to take this opportunity, sir, to thank you for making the time to come to the National Council of Provinces and to give response and give account to what government is doing. Thank you. Honorable members, just before we conclude, Honorable Mutiliani, please take your seat. Thank you very much. Honorable members, the Chief Whip of the Council has requested me to ask the provincial whips and leaders of parties to please remain. This concludes the business of the day and this house's agenda. Thank you very much.